Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another Coffee Talk in our monthly Coffee Talk series, which goes back to 2016 on our 60th anniversary year. Wide range, array of wonderful speakers. And tonight is no different in terms of something that I think a number of our members have asked for in terms of sort of help me learn a little bit more about CW and not only learn it, but also have fun with it which I think is a great title for tonight's program. Uh, we've got two excellent speakers to be able to speak on the subject tonight. Without, without further ado, guys, let me turn the program over to you. Our program tonight is how to learn and have fun with Morse code. Uh, probably two of the best guys who I, I think are around in terms of being able not only to teach Morse code, but to explain it Okay, in terms of a presentation to you tonight. Uh, we're fortunate to have Howard Bernstein, uh, WB2UZE, and Jim Kreitz, W6JM, who are our co-presenters tonight. Howard uh, has been an active ham since 1965 and holds an extra class license. He graduated from SUNY Albany in 1974 with a BS in business administration and shortly thereafter started a company in the import and export of industrial chemicals. Being partially retired gave him the opportunity to start along with Rich, K2UPS, uh, to co-found the Long Island CW Club in 2018. Uh, which they are members in, obviously uh, participating with us tonight. Besides having a passion for CW, Howard has a what he calls a boat anchor station made up of gear that he wanted to have as a young man in the 1960s, and you can probably see it on his right tonight, but could not afford it back. Outside of ham radio, Howard enjoys travel, antiques, and his 1956 Oldsmobile. Those of you can remember that, right? He's also written a book, Fire Island Lighthouse Maritime Communications, a history spanning 1859 to 1973, which centers around post-World War II Coast Guard transmitters still miraculously remaining at the Fire Island Lighthouse on Long Island. Jim Kreitz, our second co-presenter, is W6JIM, and he lives in Walnut Creek, California, beautiful Walnut Creek in California, retiring there after 30 years in the Air Force. A ham since 1996, he notes that his last single sideband QSO was in 2006. Check your log. Uh, you might have work, worked him earlier as KF6 uh, FCV, 7J7 ACM, or KF6 FCV slash TF. He's an extra class ham. He joined the Long Island CW Club in February 2019 and in order to improve his own CW. Did so well that he got invited to teach for the club six months later. He currently teaches a weekly intermediate class that practices the back and forth protocol using CW QSOs. Pleasure to turn the program over to Howard and Jim and enjoy the presentation tonight. Thank you for coming. Jim, Howard, over to you. You know, Ed, we've done many presentations, many, but I've never had an introduction like that. <laughs> that was beautiful, and I'm flattered. Got a little blushed listening to all of that. So I think you felt the same way, Jim, huh? Yeah, I'm getting I'm getting a little, my ego is growing. I got a... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I no feel pressure, like always, I, so in, in this first slide, we don't even have to introduce who we are. It's it's our pleasure to be here today, especially for Fairlawn, one of the biggest and most respected clubs on the East Coast. It's an honor that you asked us to present, Ed, and I was delighted when we got the email for you. So here we are today, and we're going to talk about how to learn and have fun. We stress the word fun with Morse code. So let's get going, Jim. All right, let's do it. Okay, what's the attraction of CW in today's high-tech world? Why would anybody want to learn CW when you have modes like FT8 that are very efficient? Well, things like this have really pushed quite a few people recently to be involved with Morse code. There's been a real interest in soda and POTA. We all know if you're going to climb up on a mountaintop, it'll be a heck of a lot easier to go up with CW equipment than sideband. And if you're going to do FT8 up there, you'll need a computer. CW rigs can be the size of a cigarette pack, and the antennas can be more compromised than you can get out. The advantage of CW is for that lightness. There's quite a few young people that are interested in this, including POTA. Is, uh, Parks on the Air is, is a major thing these days. People want to do this with CW gear because they can get out better. So people would say, well, we have FT8 and, and CW, so why CW? Well. With FT8, the computer is doing the work. The computer is the brain. But with CW, it's the mind that's doing the decoding. And we all know, especially uh, many of us are 60 years and older, we have studies in our club file that show that studying CW and using it is very good for the brain. As a matter of fact, 
We have an article that says that it can ward off Alzheimer's. Very interesting. And lastly, I'd say that why do people want to learn CW? Why is there such a resurgence? There's many people that used to do it years ago and they were forced to do it to get their license because it was required. And now that it's not and they're retired and they have more time, they want to come back to it. We get a lot of people like that. And also, you know, people are in some ways tired of everything being so technical and so easy these days, cell phones, they can do everything for us right on our palm. Using CW is a very romantic way of communicating and it's still very efficient. And people for all these reasons are coming in and we've had a, a tremendous uptick in the amount of people that want to learn. Okay, Jim, what's next? Next is uh, learning CW. Our program, I'm going to talk a little bit about the program, the method in uh, making QSOs. We just revamped our program actually over the summer. We had some guys do some incredible research and Howard might talk about it after I, I finish my turn here. But what it's turned into is our program now broken into basically three classes, class to learn half the characters, one class to learn the other half. And then you go into a final class where you actually learn how to use what you learned in the proper QSO format. And that's what I like to teach. The method is, and this is part of our new program, is we're teaching it uh, 12 words a minute. We're teaching it in a way so that you're learning a lot of the really important things up front. As we're teaching the characters, we're presenting them particular order so that we can really start to make words, abbreviations, and the things that you use in a QSO right away is to get the students used to them. So that's that's the part of our new method and program that we're doing. Everything is focused on making QSOs, even more now than it ever was in the past in our club after the summer uh, revamp that we did. We're so focused on making QSOs and found that um, the students put in the time and they do the practice. We're getting them on the air quickly and we're having a great success. Let Howard uh, add a little bit about our new program. Well, that's right, Jim. You know, when we started the club four years ago, the common thought that we heard was that you have to teach CW with what they call Farnsworth, where you would send the characters to beginners at 20 words a minute at a very high speed, but you would send it at a five word a minute transmit speed. And this was the way everybody thought a CW should be taught. And there was a certain order of letters that people talked about called the Koch method, basically started teaching KMRS. Well, after doing this for four years, we weren't happy with that. We weren't happy with that. The success rate wasn't as high as we wanted. People that were learning at this very high character speed of 20 words a minute, but sent at five words a minute when they got on the air, they're starting to hear people send at 12 and 13 words a minute. They couldn't copy. So we call that a Farnsworth gap. And we figured it's time to do away with this because it doesn't work. We studied over the past six months all the documents that we could find on the Internet that had to do with CW written by the elders, people in World War II and in the 1920s and the 1930s. Some of it was in German, we had it translated. Ich bin ein Berlin. Some by Koch, some by others. Some by people that were for the army and, and the military in World War II, where they had to crank out thousands of operators very quickly. And they were determining what the best methods were. So we can't talk too long on how we did this because time is limited here, but we revamped the entire program. And it's very exciting. And this is really the first time in maybe 30 or 40 years that anybody has rethought how to teach Morse code. And we think we're onto something very interesting. Okay, Jim, what's next? Next is uh, what kind of key do you start with? All right, straight key versus keyer. This is a very interesting topic. If you put this out on a QRZ forum and said, well, what should I start with? A straight key or a keyer? You get thousands of answers. Everybody's got an opinion. What's our take on this? We believe that you should start with a straight key up to the point of 18 words a minute. Now, why 18 words a minute? That's about the speed that you start knocking on the door of head copy. Sending manually with a straight key faster than 18 words a minute is pretty difficult. 
We believe when you learn with a straight key, you make a better mind to hand connection all the way down your arm because your mind is telling your hand what to do. When you're using a keyer, the dots and the dashes are made electronically for you. And it's a totally different thought process. When it comes to other sophisticated manual keys like bugs, we also suggest to stay off those until you're proficient at around 18 words a minute because those are complicated and we think those things are gonna distract you. Now, are we cast in stone on this? No. If you wanna use a keyer from the beginning, you're welcome to do it. This is just our suggestion. We also recommend using keyers and paddles if you have carpal tunnel or some other injury to your arm. That's what we recommend. Okay, Jim. All right, this is my specialty slide here, fear of CW. When I came to the club, as, as uh, Ed mentioned, I think it was the beginning of 2019, and I had been out of the hobby for seven or eight years. And I still remembered the code, but for the life of me, I could not remember the protocol, you know, the, the proper format to get, use the code on the air. And I knew that I knew I needed to know it, and I could, just couldn't remember what it was. And I, and I had a fear of getting on the air and uh, and experimenting and figuring it out on my own. And that led me to the club, and I'm so glad that uh, it led me to the club. But what we found as we got into the club, that was really pervasive. We have so people are generally afraid to, even after they learn the code, to get on the air and use it, fear of making mistakes and things like that. So we had to figure out a way to combat the fear. And we combat it in basically in three ways. First way is camaraderie through our classes. You know, we get to know each other and we can become friendly with each other. And, and we actually become friends through these Zoom classrooms. And that camaraderie takes away some of the fear because you're not so embarrassed to make a mistake in front of somebody. Second thing is through education. You know, we teach, of course, the, the characters, and then we teach you how a QSO works. So education will teach you, you know, what information is sent and put in the first exchange. And what is it? What is it? What are you expected to send? What are you going to receive? And what's going to happen in the second exchange? And these things are uniform. First exchange and second exchange is generally, they're always the same. And so once you know that, that takes away a whole lot of fear because now you you have an idea of what's coming and what's expected of you. And the last thing is we just always, and this is our big focus is in, in the title of our, of our uh, presentation is that we try to keep it very fun, joke around, we keep it light. And, you know, Morse code can be pretty intense, you know, whenever you're getting into it and you can, you get so focused, right? I mean, it takes all your brain power, which is why I like it. But um, sometimes we have to remind ourselves that, hey, this is a hobby. We're here to have fun and don't push yourself too hard. So those are the three things, camaraderie, education, and keeping it fun. And that's how we combat the fear. So the, you see the little picture there on the slide where it says back and forth. And that's to, to kind of show the back and forth nature of a QSO. We teach, and what I teach actually, one of the classes that I teach is QSO protocol. And the, what, the way we'd like to describe it and the way I like to describe it is it's kind of like a dance. You know, whenever you have um, two dance partners that are synced perfectly, waltz or what, or ballroom dancing, you ever watch those professional ballroom dancers that everything is just perfect. And I also think of it like a, like a ping pong match, a perfect ping pong match where nobody misses or a tennis match, you know, back and forth. It's really, when it's done right, it sounds like music to me. And it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful rhythm. It's a beautiful back and forth. It's just a beautiful thing. So that's what the back and forth is about. And we teach, we teach you how to do that. Howard? Well, uh, Jim, to, to get back for a moment on, on fear, as I experienced on this when we started the club, you know, when I got my license back in 1965, we never had any fear of anything to get on the air. N nobody was ever scared. We just got our novice licenses and got on and, and sent W right away. So I was very surprised when we started the club that people were saying that they were very uh, fearful of being either criticized or embarrassed. Some people in a way thought there's actually CW police on the air that are going to come and take them away if they made mistakes. So we adjusted the entire curriculum to deal with this and to make people feel comfortable because if they're not going to be uh, comfortable, they're not going to get on the air. And if you're not going to get on the air, you're not going to use the language that you're learning. So this was a very important thing, Jim, very important. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. I got a little ahead of myself when I was talking about the QSO protocol and why it's so important. We just spoke about the fear. And of course, the longer you delay something, the more that fear and anxiety will increase. So our focus really is to get people 
on the air as quickly as possible to break through through that fear. It doesn't grow. And as I mentioned before, we do that through the teaching of the QSO protocol so that you know exactly what's sent and when. You know, a QSO, it's very structured, especially in the beginning, and it's a good thing. Some people might look at it and think, well, gosh, that's kind of boring if you're going to send the same thing in the first two exchanges. I think it's great because I think that when you're new and you're getting on the air, you're already scared. It's nice to have something that that is like that, that you don't have to go free form or, or freestyle. You know, you can, you get to just follow the format of the QSO. And then, so it's, you know, what's coming, you know, what you're supposed to send. And then as you get beyond the second or third exchange, then you break, then and you want to go that long. Then you break into what we call rag chew territory where you would you can you know go off and talk about whatever you want but it's i think it's nice that the first couple exchanges are very uniform so that's what i have to say about uh, getting on the air and the qso protocol howard well uh, that's right jim and and how do we actually do this we have separate classes that actually teach how to get on the air and how to do it but we also have live qso classes where if you can picture this let's say everybody here that's in this room right now is in the class we're all on zoom together and i say okay let's all turn our radios on and get on the frequency of uh, 7025 we all tune on 7025 and most of us let's say especially if we're on the east coast would be able to hear whatever station is on 7025 so let's say that station is calling cq i would keep everybody informed what that station is sending to take the fear away from having to decode that. And I would say, okay, send your call sign now, drop your call sign now. And when he comes back, I'll do the uh, decoding uh, to help that person concentrate on, on the sending. And then they'll send RST and QTH and name. And under the guidance of an instructor, they'll have an actual QSO on the air while on Zoom at the same time. And we do this with many of our classes, many of our classes. And, and Howard, I just want to mention that that live QSO class can be much more exciting than watching a really good football game sometimes. I mean, you're cheering for the guy or a girl who's trying to make that call and, and reach that DX station. And they're trying to, you know, pump out the right the right code. And, uh, and with Howard uh, decoding for you, it takes off all the pressure. It's, it's like having a coach. And listening to your, your football coach or whatever it may be, you know, they have more faith in you than you may have in yourself. And we have so many people that make their very first QSO through this type of uh, environment in this class. And, and it's just, uh, I just wanted to mention how exciting it is because it's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. And I, I can remember, you know, there was an email today, Jim. There was a fellow in my live QSO class last year, made his first QSO, and now he's an instructor. You know, uh, uh, that's great. Yeah. I, I just thought about it. It was marvelous. Okay, Jim, let's go next this, one. This one's yours, Howard. Okay, head copy. I teach the head copy class. How's it done? How do you teach it? Well, if you would go online and try and read how to teach head copy or how to learn it, you'll get thousands of answers. It gives me a headache when I read these things. So basically, I just teach the way I do it and the way I learned. Now, granted, 57 years ago, I was 13 years old. My mind and my brain was a lot more malleable than it might be for someone who's 50 plus. And let's face it, the majority of hams are in that range today. But to me, there's five different pathways to do head copy. Let me just talk about a couple of them because we don't have time to go into this in detail. The main thing is that when you decode in your head, where do you hold it? Where do you hold it? I teach that you put it on a ticker tape, just like the one that you see right here in this uh, video, or like the crawl that's underneath CNN, for example, during the news. You put it on a moving ticker tape. You gotta at least put it on a stationary blackboard because you have to hold it someplace. Also, people talk about instant recognition of letters and words. I believe that's outside the ear. You have to bring the CW into your head and into your body. So I teach that you have to bring the CW into your body and one place that I like to put the vibrations is right on my chest, right beneath my neck. So it's an imaginary thing, but I feel the vibrations. So I make this a 
multi-dimensional way of decoding. I also visualize the dots and the dashes. I see them. People always come to the club and they say, oh, I made the, a deadly mistake, I'm counting. I'm counting. Everybody talks about I'm counting. I say, okay, don't worry about counting. We'll count after 20 words a minute. We'll count visually, don't worry about it. It's not the end of your life. There's many different pathways and these are the ways I teach and I show people this. Now, can people all do this? The answer is no. Is it necessary to head copy? The answer is no. There's plenty of QSOs to be done at 13, 14, 15 words a minute, and you'll have a great time. But if you wanna copy CW above 18 to 20 words a minute, it's getting very cumbersome to write, and you're gonna use a hell of a lot of paper. So at that particular point, it's best to do it in your head. But like I said, this is a presentation in itself, and we have to move on. What's next, Jim? Well, you were just talking about that there's plenty of QSOs you can have at 13, 14, 15 words a minute, and like this kind of rolls into that. Do you need to go fast? Do you need to increase your speed? The answer really is no, you don't need to. You can have lots of wonderful QSOs at 13 words a minute. Howard does it, has them every week with the K1 USN slow speed uh, contest that's every Sunday and a, a couple of times a week now, I think. But if you can even go slower, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 words a minute. Now, what we find is people come in with one to the club with one idea of what they would like to do. But then whenever they progress, they maybe might change their goals and decide they do want to get faster. So even though you can have plenty of QSOs at slower speeds, and, and I have plenty of them too, you might want to challenge yourself after you've been in the club for a while and you might want to get a little faster. And if you do want to do that, we have classes that will do that. We have classes that'll make you faster, that will give you practice techniques to get faster. And so uh, we can do it, we can do that. So it's really all up to the individual as far as increasing speed. Howard? That's right, Jim. And speed, what is speed? Just like Jim said, and we said before, you can do plenty of QSOs between 13 and, and 15, 16 words a minute and have fun. So what do you need speed for? Well, you might need speed if there's a, a DX station, that's running a pileup, those stations usually send between uh, 25 and 35 words a minute. If you wanted to operate a contest, those contests uh, go at uh, fast speed. So if you wanna get there, we have classes to take you there. Now, what speed do I do? Well, I happen to like to send and receive at 24 words a minute. Well, you might say, why does Howard say 24 and he doesn't say 22? Every word per minute above 20 actually sounds different and demands a different mental capacity. At 24 words a minute, to me, I'm still able to keep the CW in my subconscious mind where I'm really not concentrating on it and I can do other things. I can balance my checkbook. I could read the Time magazine. I can take a phone call. I can still do anything else I wanna do and still listen to the CW and not miss anything. When you start going up 25, 30, 35 words a minute, it takes a different mindset and you really gotta be paying attention. And to me, that makes me tired and I don't enjoy the CW. When the CW is in my subconscious mind, which is another thing that I talk about in head copy, it's more pleasurable to me. What's next, Jim? Uh, challenges. Yeah, challenges. challenges. Uh, this means that we're halfway through our presentation, so you guys have made it, and we have just five more areas to talk about here. Overstudy, errors, the famous plateauing, sending, and a military term that I learned from Jim. I would have never learned this if it wasn't for meeting Jim. Expectation management. So let's get started with overstudy, Jim. All right, well, overstudy. You know, there's, there's so many apps websites and different resources available now. It's so easy to come into the club and you decided that you want to learn Morse code. It's easy to overdo it because there's just so many places that you can study. You risk burning out and we don't want you to get burned out. So what we tell people is, you know, don't overdo it. Study 20 minutes a day, maybe 20 minutes, two times a day or 20 minutes, three times a day, but watch yourself and don't uh, push yourself too hard. As far as being a, a professional student there, we say, don't be a professional student. And what does that mean? It, a professional student, Howard and I would define as somebody 
who uses these websites and apps so much that that becomes their primary interest. And then, and then you know, uh, we talked about there's some fear involved of getting on the air. It's really easy to say, you know, I don't think I'm going to get on the air today. I think I'm going to keep on, I'm going to go to this website or I'm going to use this app and, and I'm only 90% good now. I'm going to keep on doing it till I'm 95%. Then I'll get on the air. And you can start making those kinds of excuses for yourself. So when in reality, once you, if you get 60, 70%, get on the air, you know, challenge yourself. And so that's what we mean by don't be a professional student. Remember why you learning the code. It wasn't to get be the best person at G4FON or what other or whatever program you're using. It's to get good enough at the code that where you can get on the air, start using it in a QSO format, and then start to improve from there. Because you can't improve in a QSO unless you're on the air doing QSOs. Howard? That's right, Jim. I mean, many people, like you said, they keep studying and studying and studying and feel they have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be on the air to learn CW. You would be strange uh, character if you were perfect on out there on the air, I think. I mean, all you have to basically do is get the guy's call sign and that's it. In the worst case scenario, you go to QRZ, look up everything that you thought you missed. So maybe you'd missed a signal report, but like we said, there's no there's no CW police that are gonna knock you on your door and take you away because you missed a signal report. Get on the air and don't make the focus uh, computer learning. Okay, Jim. Okay, the next thing uh, when you're learning CW often happens are some of these errors that I'm gonna talk about. And I'm gonna talk about, well, the first one is opposite characters. And if you know what a K is, a K sounds like this, da da da. And R sounds like this, da da da. So the dits and the da's are exactly opposite of each other. So I'll have students sometimes that'll mix up the K and the R, the P and the X, the Y and the L, because they're characters that happen to be opposite of each other. And when I hear that, I don't, usually the students who come to me and they're concerned, but I'm excited because I see that now their mind is starting to group these things together because they're similar, because they're exactly opposite. And I think that's a good thing. And it, and it doesn't last very long. It's something you work through, but I, th I think it's a good sign. And then similar characters, an S and an H, an S is three dits and an H is four dits. So it's, you, as you can imagine, that's pretty close, especially as the speeds start to increase. Same with a six and a B are very similar and a J and a one. These three, you start, when you mix up characters that are similar, that's normal because it's just all that you have to do is continue to listen and practice and your ear will start to define those things and start to pull, pick those things out. The last thing that we found was really interesting. I'm uh, affected by this myself. And a lot of people that are uh, older and, or people that are um, been in the military working around airplanes like me, you we have some hearing loss. And so what we found is uh, sometimes whenever someone is mixing up character, like similar characters, say, hey, you know, change the tone on your uh, radio or change the tone on your oscillator, wh wherever you're receiving it. And we found uh, uh, that a lot of, in a lot of cases, people can hear the code much better if they lower the pitch of the tone down a little bit, not so high and lower it to a, a lower frequency. So that's another thing that we've learned through our, through teaching over the last uh, few years. Howard? Yeah, it's very valuable, Jim, because even if you're not a learner and you're on the air as an experienced operator, it's very beneficial to be changing the pitch that you're listening to frequently to reset your mind and give yourself a break. And you'll find that sometimes you'll be able to copy better when you do that just by uh, changing the, uh, the tone. So don't uh, be married to like 600 or 700 hertz or something like that. But you know, Jim, with errors, I, I always like to tell this story. So when we started the club, there was one student that I was listening to and she was sending, every time she made a mistake, she said the word, sorry. So it, it happened like every few seconds, she made her sorry, sorry. You know what we developed after that? There's one thing that you're not allowed to do in the Long Island CW Club. The one thing you're not allowed to do, you're not allowed to say you're sorry. sorry. We don't want to hear that from anybody. There's nothing to be sorry, sorry about. And another thing that I tell people, when they're sending QSOs or when they're sending during practice sessions, a lot of people, when they make a mistake, they make a whole string of dots. Well, in reality, that's what you're supposed to do. But you want to know something? I never do it. Never. If I make a mistake, I keep going. If I spell my QTH Philadelphia and one of the letters, instead of an L, I make a D or something like that. Do you think anybody's not going to know that my QTH is Philadelphia, especially if I have a W3 call sign? 
as long as you get that PHIL out there, they'll know exactly it, what it, it is. It, it doesn't matter. And if you really think that you made a mistake, just send the word again. So there's never any need to accentuate that you've made a mistake. Any good CW operator will copy what you're doing. Okay, you know, Howard, I, I told what? my last class, we were talking about making mistakes. And I said, you know, when I was younger, I used to play pool. When I made a mistake, I never flinched because I didn't want the other guy to know I made a mistake. Maybe let him think I put the cue ball there on purpose. Same thing <laughs> with the code. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't uh, say anything, keep on going, probably won't even notice it. It probably won't even notice it, right? And anyhow, it makes you sound more professional. I agree. All right, reaching plateaus. This is a big one. A lot of people come to us and they say, well, I'm stuck. I can't get past these famous plateaus, 11, 15, 18 words a minute. I like this picture. I found a picture and Jim, who's a PowerPoint expert, put these flags on it. It's pretty cool. So how do we get people past these plateaus? Well, we use something called periodicity training. Not the word that I uh, coined. It's from one of our instructors, uh, Hal WA2AKV. Let's say you're stuck at 15. Well, we start sending to you at 20. Well, you'll say, I can't copy 20. I said, but that's okay. We're going to push you up there. Then we're going to bring you down at 10 words a minute where you can copy. Then we'll bring you back, back to 15. So we're going to shake you up like that. It's, it's the same thing I give this analogy. You know, when you're watching a baseball game, you see the batter come up. He's swinging two bats before he gets up to the plate, right? Why is he doing that? Because when he finally drops that second bat, the one bat that he's got is going to feel a lot lighter and he's going to get around very quicker on that. And that's how we deal with these plateaus. And we have a class actually that takes care of this. Okay, Jim. All right. The last thing. Sending. Sending. Yeah. We, whenever you're learning, there's a, several things that you might experience as you're learning to send. And one of the things uh, that we work through is inconsistent sending. And that would be, imagine you have a character like a J, and a J is a dit with three da's, da 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 da. And so you want each of those da's to be the same. I imagine a zero is, is five da's, you're right? And so you have a whole lot of da's in a row. And it's normal not to be consistent. You know, they're going to be different lengths and spaces, but you need, we want them to all to be the same. And that just comes with practice and sending practice. So um, that's something that we always work through. Spacing is a big one. You can imagine that if someone's talking to you and they don't leave spaces between their words, you're going to have a hard time um, picking that up. And it's the same thing with the code. It's easy when you're new, even it's easy when you're not new, to forget to put uh, spaces between your words. You might just be going a little too quick, thinking a little too fast. So we have to remind people, even intermediate and people will work on this more, is that's uh, you to actually send a space. And when I send you, send a space, think that, hey, the space goes here. You know, think of it. I, I personally, when I, a lot of times when I'm sending, I'll tap my foot in between words just to make sure that I'm, I'm leaving enough space between words. So that's a issue that we always work through. And that's something that is pretty easily worked through. And then accentuating the DAWs. I guess an example would be, I had a, a guy in a class, he could not send a certain character and it ended with a DAW. I'm trying to think if it was a it was a character that ended with a DAW. I can't remember what it was. But for some reason, that last DAW, it would just not come out. It would always be short and it would be like sound like a dit. And that changes the whole character to, to another character. So we said, I said, hey, on that last DAW, hold it down until it feels like it's too long. You know, make it too long on purpose. And he did, and he was able to successfully send the character. And with the with DAW and the code, the saying goes that you, no one's ever going to tell you that your DAWs, you're sending a DAW for too long. Uh, so you, it just, it kind of almost sounds like a little bit of a style. You get style points for it almost, but it's a good way to use your mind to really accentuate the fact that, you know, you're ending a character. So that's what we do. Um, that, that's, that's part of sending. I think the most important thing is the last thing here, and that's relaxing. Now you see the picture of a wooden fist there in our, in our picture, and that's from a World War II video where they were teaching sending. And that's to show that if you're nervous, you're tense, that your hand is going to be like it's made out of wood. It's going to be like you have a wooden fist. And if you have a wooden fist, you're not going to be able to send accurately. You know, you don't, you don't have a, the right touch. So, and along with that, if you're tense or you might have a wooden fist, you're also not going to receive very well because you're, you're tense. So you're not relaxed. You're not going to let the code flow 
over your mind. We really work on relaxing students in class and through the camaraderie and just through having fun. And it does, you know, it takes a few meetings because whenever, if you get someone brand new in a class, it's normal to be nervous and it's normal the first time you're sending in front of somebody. So we, you know, right away, we try to get everyone familiar with each other. We introduce ourselves and we get to know each other. And within, within a few classes, we're all feeling comfortable and we're not afraid to make mistakes when we're sending in front of each other. Howard? Uh, that's uh, all, all uh, true, Jim. And I just want to say uh, one more thing about the accentuation of the, of the, the DAs, the dashes. You know, it's a very common thing when people learn Morse code in the beginning that they have choppy dashes at the end, and those things can sound like dots. So if we tell them to hang on that, it really helps. And by hanging on the last dash, not only does it make your letters sound better, but it gives you somewhat of a, a fist, so to speak, or your own personality on the key. And it also tells the person who's listening to you when your letters are being finished. So it's, it's very important and it's been very helpful. Okay, Jim. Okay, I think this is your favorite slide that I, I talk about, Howard. Yeah, that's right, Jim. Management. <laughs> and, and Howard's right that uh, my last uh, 10 years in the military, this became a pretty big item because we we're doing just that, trying to manage the expectations of our force. And so in this case, we're talking about the expectation of students that want to learn CW or want to improve their CW. So, you know, sometimes you get people coming in and they think, well, I'm studying really hard and I've been in the class for a whole three weeks now. And how come I don't know more than what I do? There must be something wrong with me. And it's all about expectation management. They're expecting a little bit too much from themselves. It doesn't happen overnight. You got to be patient. And we talked earlier that you don't want to over practice because you don't want to burn out, but you do want to have your daily practice. And so that daily practice is very, very important. CW or, or Morse code, it's an oral language, comes in through your ear. But then after that, man, things can happen. You know, you, you can visualize it, you can feel it, but it starts right here in your ear. So it's something that you have to tune your ear to, you know, just like you're you would tune your ear to a new language. If you're learning a new language, you know, you have to use it, you have to hear it and you have to understand it. So well, I always say I've had meetings with intense students over the last three years. We're concerned about their progress. And in each one of those cases, they were absolutely fine. They were, they were either where they should be or they were ahead of where they should normally would be. And they were, they were doing great. And all those students are doing fine now, but they had such high expectations for themselves that they felt like they weren't going fast enough. That's expectation management in a nutshell. Howard? Well, you know, Jim, just today, and this is really the truth, Jim, just today, there was an email that came from someone who joined the club last mm -hmm. week, last week. Yeah. And he said in his email, Howard, I did the lesson where I learned three characters. And then I took my second lesson and learned the next three characters and everything fell apart. And I couldn't remember anything. I'm all upset and, you know, think I'm doing the wrong thing. And and I don't know why I can't learn. It's unbelievable, right? <laughs> not even on the second lesson. Now, well, no, nobody said it, learning the code was easy, but it's not I, that hard. I mean, you know, that's what makes it fun. What I'm going to say here is that you'd have to ask yourself, if CW is an oral language, just like any other language that's spoken, how long would it take you to learn Spanish before you could speak to somebody? Think about that for a moment. Or German or whatever. How about Chinese? It would take I, months. Yeah, you would expect to at least spend months uh, practicing before you try to talk to somebody, I think. But people pressure themselves and they expect of themselves that this is going to happen overnight and it's not. But you it does happen. But it does happen. It, it does happen, but it, it's not going to happen overnight. So no. uh, expectation management is a, is a very important thing. And that's why we, we have this slide here. So, you know, relax. We might need a new, might need a new class just in this. <laughs> You'll be the teacher. So, you know, relax, have fun, give yourself a few months. We say that if you go to two classes a week, if you practice 30 minutes a day, within three to four months, you'll be ready to get on the air. Talk to me in three to four months if you haven't made progress, not in one day. Okay, Jim, I think we're at the end here. We are. Now we have some fun stuff. Now we have fun stuff. Okay. So this is one of my favorite videos. I love the Three Stooges. Everybody who knows me knows I'm a Three Stooges fan. And this is great. This 
we say is an example of what's going to happen to our students if they don't pay attention, if they don't pay attention. Here it goes. Short wave, take it down, quick. What's it say? <laughs> ah, shut up. What'd that mean? <laughs> you too? I, I love this. I've seen it a thousand times. Now, we can't hit our students because we're over Zoom. Ah, shut up. Uh, so <laughs> it's not going to happen. But let me tell you, the CW in this is perfect CW with a beautiful fist, like on a straight key from the 1930s. Groups, no vowels, and it's, it's just beautiful CW. What's next, Jim? Spark Gap. Oh, Spark Gap. Okay. We were lucky enough to buy a replica of a Spark Gap machine before COVID. And we were going to be using this in Ham Radio University here on Long Island. Maybe some of you New Jersey folks have come over to, um, to that. I see Ed is nodding his head. He probably knows about it. And we were going to demonstrate this, but we never got a chance because uh, Ham Radio University has been on Zoom for the past three years. But this is made out of actual parts that are real and that coil is a real helix coil so take a look at this we here we go um starting george flanagan's spark app machine i like the way this thing sounds the way it's heating up so here we go i'll send a cq I certainly wouldn't put my finger over there, but it's really oh. cool. Uh, very, very cool, this machine. Very cool. I hope we'll be able to present it this year. You know, that was overloading my friend's cell phone. There was so much RF that <laughs> you can hear it's overloading the phone. Okay, Jim. Telegraph sounder. Okay, the sounder. It's actually sitting behind me here. This is another way to communicate uh, CW. Go ahead, Jim. Hello, everyone out there in TV land. This is Howard WB2UZE, and I'm in my shack here where we have uh, mostly modern equipment and my dog Chomper on my lap. But I'm here to demonstrate today a Morris code sounder that's from the late 1800s. It's something that I found in a um, basement of an old ham shack and um, there was a lot of stuff down there and this was just peeking out at us and we were lucky to find it and it's in perfect condition. Most hams are really not able to understand CW with clicking. They're all used to tones. But some of us can and I'm here to demonstrate how it sounds. I'm using a JT38 World War II vintage key, and here's the sounder. So let's send a CQ. That's CQ, CQ, and then from W2 LCW. Again. Can even send with my dog licking my hand. There we go. Yeah, so my dog, when he comes up here, licks my hand, and Dexy the cat will sit right down on top of my Begali key and my logbook. So uh, that's the way it is. <laughs> All right, Jim. Howard, the last video is the instructor graph. So All right. Our people might remember this. Yeah, I mean, um, I took my uh, FCC exam in 1965 with one of these in uh, <laughs> lower Manhattan. We have three of these and we got one of them to work. This is really cool. There it goes. That's perfect CW. It's perfect. 
And this thing's from the 1930s, the Instructograph. That's the brand name of it. Okay, Jim, what do we got? Oh, now we just got to talk about the keys for a second and then tell them about our club. Yeah, we're almost, we're almost done. <laughs> well, I've been using, uh, as you see these keys here on the upper left-hand corner is what uh, Howard uh, uses. It's a Begali HST. It's a single lever paddle. Next to it is a straight key, the Begali blade. I have one of those and that's, I enjoy sending with that myself. Um, but lately I've been using a lot of bugs and um, you see a Vibroplex bug down there in the lower left-hand corner, which is a semi-automatic key. And then there's another uh, straight key, the J38 down there in the lower lower right. You really like your HST, don't you, Howard? Yeah, I got it right here. And I was lucky enough that my head copy class actually gave this to me as a gift. And it really saved my wrist and my hand because I was using, I don't have it up here, but I was using one of these Vibroflex paddles. It looks like the bug and it's like heavy metal and I'm slamming my wrist back and forth and it was murder on my knuckles. And the Begali HST has got a single lever and it's so tight and you don't have to really push it much to, to move and it's beautiful. And of course, um, the J38s, I have one right here. These are from World War II. If you can find one of these on eBay for 70 or $90, you can't mm -hmm. kill these things. This one here was made by the Lionel Company, the same company that was making trains in the 1950s. They were pressed into service in World War II to make keys. Can you believe it? Okay, Jim, a little bit about the club. We got started four years ago. We have over 3,100 members in 47 countries. We have 130 teachers and instructors. Every week, we have 75 classes on Zoom and their classes and forums that teach things just like we have right here. So Monday night, we have our radio and related technology forum where we could you know, talk about anything from um, Amelia Earhart to a microwave, just like Fairlawn does. Uh, Wednesday night, CW Makers, we teach people how to make things. Then Saturday, we have a portable operations forum. Uh, Saturday afternoon, we have a boat anchor forum. So. We have something every day besides uh, CW, and we do that to actually make it fun to do all of this. If we we're just CW only, it wouldn't be having fun. It would be doing work. So we figured we'd make a community that does something for everybody. Here's a partial listing of some of the classes and the type of presentations that we do. Okay, what's next, Jim? Next, we can take some questions, Howard. Oh, yeah. All right. So that's uh, it, Ed. And, you know, we love q and A. I know everybody's going to be a little bit afraid to ask questions. That'll be that. Uh, Just like code, that, right? that will so, be that, that deer in the headlights thing for, for a few minutes. We'll stay as long as anybody wants to stay. Okay. I see a couple of hands up right now. But first, Howard and Jim, I've just got to say this was fabulous. Okay. I mean, you've given me some entirely different perspective. I'm doing CW and learning CW from when I was a kid. so Well, I, well Ed, we both love Morse code, and I, I hope that came out across really in our did. presentation. It really did. So, and um, yeah, I mean, if I, if I get a little word, I'll, I'll have a, yeah, I see a couple of questions right off the bat. So that's great. I, so why don't we go Bill, uh, A-W-2-A-W-L, Tom, uh, Abazia, and then I think I saw Jim had a hand up, and if there's others, I can't see everybody, but I'll do my best. So Bill, Tom, and then Jim to get us started. There, Howard, ahead, Bill Mr. Ledger. I've been taking courses with Amanda on Wednesday. I can't continue. Has the carousel begun with the new classes? Uh, the carousel began a few weeks ago. So uh, we're going to be phasing out Amanda's class in February anyhow, Bill. We call those classes legacy now. So just jump on the carousel. And the reason we call it the carousel is there's no beginning and no end. You start any time and you'll never be behind. All right, if I have any other questions, I'll email you. Yeah, you'll email me, and if we, we talk on the phone, uh, that, that'll be fine, too, okay? Nice seeing you face-to-face. -face. Okay, and thank you for joining, Bill. Tom, over to you, KB2 ESE. Thanks, Ed, and great presentation, guys. Should, should a beginner uh, CW operator start with a paddle or a straight key? We say straight key, and if you look at the recording, you'll see why, okay? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 
other questions from the floor. Yeah, you know, Howard, I've got a question just, I guess, before anybody else jumps in. Is that I was sort of thinking about, you know, when I was learning code, and you brought it up early because, I mean, I suspect a lot of us are contemporaries and going back to the 60s and 70s and learning code. I got my license in 76, and obviously, you know, you had the five-word requirement and then the 13 and then the 20. And I can always remember that, A, I learned alone, okay, which Jim mentioned the word camaraderie at the beginning of the presentation. That struck me because I said, you know, I didn't have anybody to learn with. You know, so, I mean, I was out on my own and I always remember I was scared, you know, to you know make my first CW contact. But that also triggered the thought of at least there was a novice band and there were other guys that I could talk to, you know, in that period. And for somebody who's just learning code now, you know, when I get back on, it seems like there's a lot of high speed operators. I don't see as many slow or medium speed operators. Could you talk a little bit about that as to, you know, maybe a what what you tell people? You know, when okay. they sort of jump out of the nest and now they've got to learn, you know, how well, to fly. You know, uh, how does that work? You know? Okay. Well, uh, Jim knows this uh, very well, too. There's certain frequencies where slower speed people congregate. Yep. Let's, let's talk about a band plan, for example. Let's talk about 40 meters. The lower 25 kilohertz, Ed, is really for high speed. Yeah. Why? Because that was the extra band for many years and extra people you know had to qualify at, at 20 words a minute back in the day so traditionally that's where the dx is and that's the higher speed now when you start to get above 7025 it gets slower and slower and then when you're up around 7050 or 7060 that's where Stray Key Century Club is that Jim can talk about for a minute about the activities that they have. People congregate there. Your POTA guys will be there and they're not necessarily sending fast. And then, Ed, if you remember, the old novice band was at 7100. Yep. Yep. Now, yep. I... you can go above 7100 and call a CQ at a slow speed. You'll probably get an answer. Yeah, there's lots of uh, slow speed operators up above 7100, between 7100 and 7120. Like Howard said, it seems like 40 meters right around uh, 77040 to 7060. You're going to find plenty of people going at a, a leisurely pace and easy to copy. Yeah, that, and that's and that's really good to know because, I mean, I come back and I get rusty and I tend to go on the higher side of the band. But, you know, obviously, if I'm not a new operator, you know, so, you know, it's, it's, I just, it's great that you guys tell everybody as to where, you know, where it is. And, and it would be the it. same on, on every band. So 20 meters would be the same thing and same yep. with 80. And so you could also you, send me, uh, well, you could also send me an email and I could jump on the air and I'd be happy to try to, to meet you sometime. <laughs> if you good. get out this way. Yeah, sure. And what is your speed these days? Um, you know, I can, I mean, I do probably 20 fairly relaxed. You know, I, I'm, I'm comfortable maybe a little bit higher. Yeah, you know, certainly not at 30. I mean, I'm just not on. You, know, you better that contact easy. Howard then. That's, he'll yeah. go faster with you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other questions, please. Uh, Ed, comments. Yeah, Whiskey 2 Alpha Alpha Bravo, an old time CW guy myself, long time. I have, uh, first of all, compliments for you. An excellent presentation all around, guys. I appreciate it. In fact, I was the one who suggested to Ed that we get you guys here <laughs> because I know your uh, reputation, and I'm also a CW Ops guy, and they have their own program too, but you guys are great. I really appreciate what you do. Now, question. Either one of you, favorite straight key, favorite bug, favorite non-iambic keyer, favorite iambic keyer. Now, two other questions, single lever or dual lever? Your own personal preferences, I'm just curious. Well, the, the, this could um, create a storm on the internet if that question was asked. <laughs> and yeah. by the way, Fred, you got a wonderful audio. Well, I'm just modulating. I'm not a big phone guy, but I get on phone now and then. Howard, what, I know what your favorite key is, Howard. Yeah, Jim, you're, you're more of a key aficionado than me. So why don't you answer Fred and then I'll make my... Okay. Uh, I'll, my tell you a couple, I'll tell you a couple of my favorite keys. Uh, right now, favorite bug is a VizKey vertical bug. I could show it to you here. Maybe I can... 
or if I oh, yeah. in front of my face. I like it because it can go as fast as I'm able to. I don't, I don't, I'm not a super fast sender. I go over 20, but not too often. I do operate a lot of new people. And so I like to be able to slow it down. And this thing will slow down to like 13 words a minute, really easy, without having to do anything special to it. So mm. um, right now I'm using this, but when I want to go a little bit faster, I'm, hey, I've got, I've got a 1916 a Vibroplex original standard a left hand a model. I'm a right hander. But I send with a left-handed bug because I learned backwards because I didn't have I didn't have a Elmer whenever I was learning how to send. So I send the dits and the das backwards for most people. So I have to use a left-handed bug. So um, that's what I do for bugs. But Vibroplex overall is my favorite. I always go back to Vibroplex uh, as far as bugs go. As far as a straight key, right in front of me, I've got this uh, called the PB213. I'm not sure by made by Phil Boyle. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that uh, straight key. No. He's in England, uh, Phil Boyle, PB213. He makes a wonderful straight key. And so that's what I'm, that's what I have in front of me now. And in fact, I, and I got this other straight key in front of me that I really like. It's a uh, Bama key. It's made in Germany, B-A-M-A key. Mm -hmm. And it's the, they make one straight key, a desktop straight key that I use that, that I really like. It. It's this one right here. So you see it? It's unique looking too. It's kind of neat. Mm. Nice. It's got a nice look. As far as paddles go, I, I learned on a paddle. And so I, uh, I've got tons of paddles, but I learned on a 10 tech paddle. And I've also got an HST and I really like that HST, but I found I, but I've been mostly on bugs and in, in uh, straight keys for the last the year, I think. So I haven't been on paddles too much lately. So those are my favorite. What about you, Howard? You know, it's an interesting question, Fred. And I never really knew that people cared so much about keys passionately until I got involved with the club because I could when I was a kid I could never afford anything so I got this you know, Vibraplex heavy metal paddle mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I used that thing for like uh, 30 years um, it was used at the time that I got it and my my first straight key I still have here look look at this Fred this is like an Amico key that I put on a piece of wood. This, this. Yeah, my is first one was was a Speedex. It was plastic. Yeah, this, this is this <laughs> fifty nine cents. This is Bakelite. I I, yeah. I, I didn't yeah, know I, I think should, Bakelite, right? I didn't right. know I should screw this down on the wood, Fred. So I hit it with a hammer, and it, it broke. <laughs> it broke in nineteen sixty five. It's still on the piece of wood here. So you put you put nails in there, Howard. Yeah, I put nails in there. What did I know? <laughs> what did I know? I was I was 13 years old. So I never really thought much about keys. The only time that I, I got a new key is when um, this this particular heavy metal Vibroplex went bad on me. I got a new one. And then the club got me the HST. Now, the HST I really like because on my 70-year-old knuckles, um, it stopped the, uh, the inflammation. So... I, I default to saying that that's my favorite key, but I could, I could use anything. I never thought twice, whatever key somebody gave me, you just adjust your wrist and your mind and, and, and you send. I, I've made some demonstrations to people where I've sent CW on a pipe or with two alligator clips <laughs> and the fist is the same. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. We sent on anything that we had back in the day. Didn't matter, Fred. Now, you know, I've used every kind of key, the straight key, bug, non-iambic uh, keyer, and iambic keyer, single lever and dual lever. And I must say, except for the cootie, I have a cootie in my key collection, but I've never used it. That takes special getting used to. Some people love them. I, I've never even used it, but it's an old, it's an original uh, Bun L made around 1900. Hmm. I have found the greatest straight key of them all is the Navy Flame Proof. Yeah. If you're familiar with that, you yeah. put it on a heavy base and man, that just, yeah, that's the a nice code key. just, just, just flows right off. It's, of it. it's, it's that and the J38. Um, well, the J38 I've used too, but uh, they're nothing like the uh, Flame Proof. To me, yeah. that's, the best piece of engineering ever that that, that came out of our yep. country, as a matter of fact, yep. for a straight key. Everybody likes those uh, those flame proof and 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 the Camelback keys that they make now, which is kind of I have well, I have a real Camelback from about yeah. eighteen seventy, yeah. and, and it's very smooth. Oh, nice! Yeah, it's it's a it's a Tillotson, hmm. it's a Tillotson uh, Camelback. How and many the, keys do you have, Fred? Oh gosh, I don't know. 
it's not a large collection. I thinned out a lot of stuff. I sold a lot of bugs and so on that I had. But I'm just concentrating, particularly concentrating on early keys and early telegraph instruments, uh, except for a few others like 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 the flame proof, which I love. That's a, just a beautiful key. Huh. You know, but I use every kind of key there is, except for the cootie. You would love this class that we just started on Thursday. We have a guy who's a uh, uh, an expert on um, early telegraph history, and that's what he's teaching. Just had his first class on Thursday. That's interesting stuff. Yes, he was. He was the guy who helped uh, Steven Spielberg with the Lincoln movie. No kidding. <laughs> that's Thanks. impressive. So, so. Any any other questions? Or yeah, this is W two A B E and. Yep. Uh, Got a question. I've been told that instead of learning letters, you should learn words. And a couple of years ago, I started practicing Morse code and I got to the point that I could probably send it slowly. And uh, I do like I do have a flame proof, which I really like. That was really good. But I had another key that I don't know what it is. It's very ancient and it's comfortable to use. But my problem is I was in one of these situations where I was driving loud vehicles for many years. My hearing's not the best. So I could send, but I got uncomfortable trying to copy. And I guess I'd have to find something where it's very slow to learn it. But what's the best way to do that? Is it with words or individual letters? Um, you know, in, in the revamping of our curriculum, Fred, we are bringing in instant character recognition of letters and words into the beginner's curriculum. So we're going to do a little bit of everything. So we don't say there's one way to do it. You still have to learn the individual characters, but we do bring that in. Something you might be interested in, Fred, we have developed a haptic device that will decode and send vibrations to your hand. And we're in our final trials of this now and we're going to be going into uh, commercial production. If you'd like to um, get one of these, uh, please keep in contact with me because we're going to start building them in a couple of months. Um, like my biggest problem with hearing is that sometimes somebody will say something. I hear it, but I'm not quite sure whether I heard it right, so I'll ask again. And I think it probably drives people crazy a little bit. But I, you know, it's it's not that I don't hear it. It's just that I'm not sure what I heard sometimes. Well, that's true. And this isn't this device. If you get the CW vibrations to your hand, not only does it help people who are um, uh, with hearing difficulties, but it will help people that don't because we talked about the multiple pathways before. Um, vibrations is a very <laughs> important way of learning CW. And uh, this could be revolutionary uh, for people that do not have hearing problems. We're very yeah. excited about this device. And I, and I agree with you guys about CW versus other digital forms that we know about that. And with CW, you have to use your brain. And actually, the other way, the computer's doing it. I mean, I know people who make QSOs while they're having, making a turkey sandwich and stuff like that. And that's not to me, but to, you know, to actually use your brain and talk to somebody either on sideband or by CW, that's like communicating with a human being. It's a big difference for me. And thank you very much for the excellent presentation has taken some of the fear of CW away from watching it. Thank you so much. You're quite Thank welcome, you, Fred. Thank you, Fred. Van, one or two last questions. I see your hand up. Okay, good evening. And uh, thanks to, uh, to Jim and Howard. That was an excellent presentation. I got my license in 1956 and I have an affliction. I'm left-handed. So I learned to send with a straight key with my left hand and I got a hold of a Vibroplex bug, but I surely couldn't afford a left-handed bug back then. So I learned to send with my right hand with a bug and my left hand with a straight key. And then as Jim W2JC knows, we ended up copying code on a typewriter and later a teletype. And that took away the left-handed disadvantage. But uh, then I was off the air for about 30 years and I'm struggling to get back above 20 words a minute. And some of the suggestions you guys had were really, really nice, will help me a lot. I probably will be number 3,101 <laughs> members of the uh, CW club. Thanks well, a lot, guys. 
Van, we'll be we'll be looking out for you. It'll be our pleasure to have you in the club, and um, it'll be wonderful you, for you to get your your skills back. They'll they'll come back. This is like muscle memory of the brain. It'll it'll come back. A so bicycle, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's it. That's right. Thank you, Van. So, uh, one anyone want to have one final question? W two JC's got a question. Correct, J, J, Jim. You have the last word. Some people might want to ask this also. Why is the bug called a bug? <laughs> Very Howard, good. Howard, you you were around whenever they invented the bug. Didn't you? <laughs> you know, I I heard that explanation a few times, but I never memorized it. You know the answer to that, Jim? I don't know. I've never even. I I. That's an interesting <laughs> question. No, but I, I know. I I. You know, uh, Jim J C. If if you Google this, the answer is there. But I don't. I don't remember that. I can tell you what I heard about that years ago. If you look at the Vibroplex semi-automatic key, and they're all called semi-automatic keys that they're mechanical, mm -hmm. but the Vibroplex logo includes a little bug in the image. Right. Yeah. And that's what I think stuck. Because yeah, maybe that, maybe they know, most of them were Vibroplexes, but, but there were lots of other companies making bugs, and they call them bugs, but they're really technically all called semi-automatic keys. Uh, that would be that would make sense. And when Jim asked that question, I was uh, picturing that emblem on my key, but I I don't didn't know why they had put it there. There must be a reason why they put a bug there too, Fred. You know? Who knows? I don't Who know knows? why. But that's a good Google homework for everybody. That's that's your homework assignment tonight, guys. <laughs> and that becomes the last word. Herbert. <laughs> Bug is the last. Again, Howard, Jim, thanks again. Great presentation. Thanks to everybody. And seven. Okay, good, good night, night everybody. everybody. Good Thank night you. Everybody. Thank you.